Thanks, Luis. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be back in, uh, in Newfoundland. It's been a, a few years since, uh, since I was last here. And it also kind of reminds me of just how long it's taken me to, uh, to write up this, uh, this paper, because it was a piece of work, really, that came out of my postdoc here at, at MUN. Uh, my old office mate, Rich Callow, who, who now works uh, in Norway for Statoil, uh, he and I, and, along with Duncan, worked on the, uh, looking at the Cambrian explosion in terms of the bioturbation and the, uh, really trying to get a handle on what the, the trace makers may have been doing. And I guess I became somewhat sort of fascinated and even obsessed with this uh, concept of ecosystem engineering, um, which was uh, introduced in the 1990s, really to, to talk about two different sort of types of organisms whereby they either, their physical structures create new uh, ecosystems or their behavior uh, creates new ecosystems. And I guess the, 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 sort of the classic uh, allergenic ecosystem engineer is the, uh, that Canadian icon, the beaver, where moving uh, trees around to completely recreate it or completely create a new habitat and, and produce a, a effectively a sort of small pond to lake system it was in engineering new habitats obviously precluding certain organisms but also then creating habitat to be exploited by um, many others and in terms of the uh, in the marine realm the the sort of the most important allergenic ecosystem engineers are bioturbating organisms and this figure drawn up by um, uh, Lizzie Kalmeyer, who was a, a PhD, a master student here, summarizing some of the sort of classic examples from the marine realm of, uh, of things like, uh, here's a, a, a goby and a, and a crab and a, a scale worm living in this calianacid shrimp burrow and, and the, the structures produced, this, this complex produced by the, the shrimp creates habitat ecospace for a number of different organisms. Indeed, th what this only really shows is the macro scale. There are many, many other smaller scale organisms living within those systems. A variation on that, a different type of calian acid shrimp producing a more uh, pellet lined burrow, which in the trace fossil record would be uh, probably a sign something like Ophiomorpha. Again, that structure has been uh, linked to a number of different uh, organisms living within that environment that are specialized to, to live in this, this engineered habitat. Um, and also perhaps slightly more mundane fashion, I spent a lot of time on the, uh, on the North Sea sort of coast around Hull and the Humber <laughs> estuary in, in England. And you see an awful lot of lugworm casts where these uh, annelids are living in a sort of J-shaped to U-shaped system um, and producing fecal casts, uh, producing a, a, I think the, uh, the red light has gone, producing a J-shaped structure which uh, has various different sort of micro habitats which are then exploited and utilized by, by different organisms. And so what we really wanted to, to sort of try and look at was, was can we, oh, I've got a different color pen perhaps now, let's see what happens. Oh, okay, grand, yeah, so this is, a, this is the annelid. And again, you'll see various different organisms living in and around the burrow system in different microhabitats created, engineered by that organism. So what we really wanted to look at was how this was potentially manifested in the geological record. Of course, in most cases with trace fossils, we don't have clear evidence of the trace makers, but perhaps we can still make some reasonable interpretations of, of what kinds of um, habitats are being created um, and potentially being, being utilized. And we've talked a little bit about this at other conferences. In this particular case, I wanted to look specifically at the evolution of, um, of, the, of the different burrow types in the earliest Cambrian. And to sort of look at this you know, transition from uh, what we've seen in various presentations already today, that the sort of the mat ground dominated ecosystems of the, of, of the Ediacaran into the, the, the more mixed ground systems of the, of the Phanerozoic. And of course, this uh, diagram is a little bit uh, abrupt in its uh, transition from, from one form to another. But what we then wanted to try and look at was can we look at the particular types of trace fossils and maybe uh, assess what those, those structures may have been and what they may have been uh, representing and what perhaps their impact may have been uh, on the informal uh, environments. And that then sort of raised the question of how do we try and assess which of these early burrow structures uh, 
how, you know, how, what kind of impact would, they, would those structures have had? We don't say, we don't see what trace makers um, actually made these structures, but there's a, quite a variety of different structures present in these early Cambrian biotivated successions. Of course, yeah, everyone's now very familiar with, with uh, Treptichnus. Um, here's a, a nice example of Gyrolithes from the, uh, the, the Fortune Head GSSP succession. Um, and again, I guess I, I really enjoy being an ichnologist in the sense that the ichnology community is very open, sorts of interesting discussions. But we do have one minor issue at times, whereas we have a bit of a, a tendency to have terminology that, that sort of speaks primarily to ichnologists. And one of the things we wanted to try and look at, rather than assigning perhaps some of our ichnological terms to the trace fossils, um, some of you may already be familiar with some of these uh, ethological characteristics uh, and char um, characterizations of, of trace fossils, of, of things ending in ichnia, uh, paschichnia, uh, repichnia, and, and, and so on. The problem with these terms is a lot of people don't really know what they mean, and they don't really tell us um, or don't really allow us to try and assess what the, the trace makers necessarily would, were having in terms of the impact on the, on the sedimentary environment. So what we decided to try and do was to look at what the marine biologists uh, do with, with bioturbation uh, in terms of different types and different impacts of, of, of bioturbation styles and see what we can then potentially try and apply to the geological record, and so in this case, particularly the, the early Cambrian. So the left-hand side of this figure uh, is, is a, a summary diagram based on work by Martin Solan, who's now in Southampton, and Ben Wiggum in, in Newcastle, um, who characterised effectively, well, they, they had seven categories. We've slightly simplified it down to uh, six categories, which I think is kind of also what uh, Lewis and, and Gabriella did in their uh, Ichnology book a couple of years ago. But effectively, they recognised that biotivators were epifaunal locomotors or, or epifaunal locomotion, sort of trail structures, they were, or they were surficial modifiers. So these epifaunal traces were simply just locomotion trails moving over the surface. Surficial modifiers would be shallowly ploughing through the sediment at a depth of a few millimetres, maybe down to a centimetre or two. And then as you move down into the sediment a little bit more, there were various different types of, of behaviour manifested. This is a, a photograph of, of an amphipod uh, tank. We had burrowing amphipods uh, in the sediment and they are effectively biodiffusing, they're moving particles sort of fairly randomly around on a small scale, they don't really produce uh, discrete burrow structures, but they move particles around on a, on a, uh, on a sort of small but relatively random scale. And then there are conveyors, of two, we've got two different diagrams here because you can have upward conveyors, that's uh, burrowing animals that are bringing sediment down from, from depth and back up to the surface. Or you can have downward conveyors, organisms taking material from the surface and, and bringing it down to, to depth. We've kind of lumped these together as, as, as conveyors, but Martin Solon and, and Ben Wigan did dis differentiate <coughs> between the two, having upward and downward. Regenerators are uh, burrowing organisms that don't necessarily live in the sediment all the time. And this particular fiddler crab uh, ex excavates a, a hollow um, and then and that sediment is then washed away and then it may move around on the surface for a while and then go back into the sediment and excavate another hollow and that sediment gets transported away. So they're effectively kind of chucking sediment out into the water column and then creating another hollow later on. And then finally, uh, gallery biodiffusers, to some degree still doing uh, what the... Wow, am I running out of power on two red projectors? This is quite exciting. How many... Uh, no, it's still going, it's still going. The, um, the diffusion part of, of what we see in this type of behaviour is present within this gallery system. This is again one of these calian acid shrimp, but they're producing uh, a much bigger gallery network. So although there's small scale biodiffusion taking place over short distances uh, within the margins of the burrow, it's actually then manifested over a much larger area because of the gallery uh, that the organism produces. So these are the categories that they recognise. And we thought, right, well, we'll see if we can apply that to the geological record. Then the ecospace model, uh, that Bambach et al. published a few years ago. Uh, we wanted to look at, at the sort of the depths that the organisms were um, uh, potentially going to. So are they going down you know, centimetres into sediment? Or are they just at the, at the surface? Um, and then last but not least, we wanted to also see if we could assess any indication of bioirrigation um, where the burrow is being irrigated by the occupant over uh, longer periods of time. And this has been touched upon again in, in, in earlier talks today. One of the key things about living in the sediment for any length of time is, is to keep that uh, oxygenation within, within the burrow system uh, and, and allow the, the organism to live within the sediment. So virtually all organisms that live within 
marine sedimentary environments now in, in, in burrow systems irrigate to some degree, and many of them irrigate uh, for a considerable proportion of their, uh, of their lives. So what we then sort of try to say, okay, well, we've got these, these different um, ways of looking at bioturbation's impact. Um, can we then sort of apply them to the, the early Cambrian burrow systems that we see? So we've, again, from the work that Martin Sell and Ben Wiggum did, you can effectively sort of say, well, the epifaunal locomoting structures have very limited infaunal impact. Um, and although it's not a, 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 a clear sort of stepwise scale of impact, in a general sense, the sufficial modifiers are a little bit more significant, the biodiffusers a bit more significant still, the regenerators a little bit further, and then the conveyors and finally the gallery biodiffusers have increasing uh, sort of ecosystem uh, and, and informal eco, eco space impact. That can then also be sort of looked at from the eco space model of taking, say, whether the, the traces are sufficial semi-infaunal, shallow or, or deep, um, how tiered are these burrows, how far down into the sediment are they actually going. Um, and then by irrigation, we attempt to then look at whether the burrow is being almost certainly not irrigated, occasionally irrigated or, or frequently irrigated. Now that's a rather more challenging thing to try and assign into the, the trace fossil record. So we're necessarily some of this is, is a bit more speculative than, than others, but the idea was to try and bring some of these, these sort of marine biology um, approaches back to trace fossils. So here is the, uh, the, the Fortune Head GSSP uh, succession with a, a collation of data published by, by various uh, people, um, some of Duncan's data and a number of other people's work all sort of built together. So the, the, all the trace fossil types listed up here, a lot of them still sort of debated a little bit exactly that which name should be applied to certain ones. And then their range is shown through the, the different, uh, different ICNO zones, uh, and then the, the more sort of uh, classic stratigraphy shown on the side, including some of the more recent names that have now been uh, defined. And then on the right hand side, the sort of maximum tiering depth that has been recorded in this, uh, in this succession and then the maximum burrow size. And you can see that here we've got centimetres, naught to six centimetres on each of these scales. So you're not typically looking at large burrows and not looking at enormously deep uh, structures. Okay, so just to quickly sort of show them an example of one, one particular classic burrow from the succession of what, uh, what we've applied to it. So <coughs> treptichnus, we can be pretty confident it's not an epifaunal locomotion trail, but actually of the other categories, you can argue different ways depending on what you think treptichnus was, and this kind of goes back to what Luis was talking about this morning, there's different ways of looking at what, what treptichnus may have been, so you can end up giving a sort of range of, of, of possible values from sort of sufficient modification through to something more gallery-like, uh, but we can be fairly sure, from the, at least from the, uh, the, the fortune head successions, that the Burrows are fairly shallow structures. They're going down maximum, maximum of, of a couple of centimetres. But there's a, there's a, again, it depends a little bit upon what interpretation you're going to apply to the, the, the trace maker. But if you have a sort of gallery system or proto-gallery system that was occupied for a length of time, then it's likely that some uh, irrigation of that, of that burrow uh, would have taken place for the organism to live in that burrow. If it's not, of course, that then changes that, that um, value slightly. But we think there's certainly some potential that treptichnus uh, would have been either passively or directly irrigated uh, at least some of the time. So let me just say, so, so summarise this in the paper that's, that's come out in the, um, in the, the, the memorial volume to, to Martin. And these are just the, the selection of taxa, ICNO taxa that, we, that we've used and assign these sort of ranges of values to come up with a, a sort of broad range of possible impact value that these different traces may have had and necessarily they've got quite a range because you can apply different um, different elements to the, to the interpretations. The functional group side of it is, is typically the most varied because many of them you can interpret different ways and therefore get a broader range of, of values. I should say this, these are sort of attempted at some sort of quantitative um, approach but it is necessarily semi-quantitative. They're not trying to say that these are all um, linear scale of impact. They're giving a sort of range of, of, of possible values that we need to, to try and develop a bit more of that, uh, that work. I think the, the, the broad thing that seems to come out of this is that, that at least most of the functional groups, even if the burrows are mostly small and not particularly deep, typically most of the functional groups appear to have evolved by Cambrian 
stage two. Um, and the more sort of gallery-like or, or more penetrative structures that were probably occupied for, for longer periods of time must have been irrigated to some degree, either passively or, or actively, so we don't know what the tracemaker is in, 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 in the borough systems. The important thing there is the, the generation of advective flow into the sediment, whereas these systems would have previously been diffusive flow through the, through the finer grained material. Once you start creating these, these larger structures with some degree of irrigation in them, then you are creating a different uh, <coughs> system of, of flux within the, the sediment. Um, and then really, the, although Treptichnus is, of course, a diagnostic trace fossil um, of, of the early Cambrian, it may not have been sort of the most important as an as a sort of engineering structure because structures more like gyrolithes are, are, are deeper, um, potentially had longer-term occupation, um, and potentially had well, created greater eco-space and potentially greater uh, nutrient flux. So it's necessarily, we're still something of an of a, um, early stage of trying to apply this, this sort of approach, but we're, we're seeing if we can then take this to other parts of the world and the periods of geological column and, and start thinking about trace fossils in a more modern marine biological way um, and trying to sort of assess their, their impact on engineering ecosystems in various points of time. So I will leave you at that point. Thank you.